intervention week. So, thank you. Um, I also have my counterpart, Karen Louisa from Family Link with me. And um, I'm sure many of you, have, of you have been receiving a lot of emails and information from us this week. So um, you probably recognize our names. Uh, but before I jump in, I just wanted to let you know that this presentation is being recorded. You just saw the pop up um, so that we can use it as a resource for other families. And the recording link with all the resources will be sent to you um, probably about early next week, as soon as we can get everything put together. Um, I'm quickly going to give a little bit of background information first before I introduce our speaker for tonight. I apologize if you have already attended any of our other virtual events and already heard this spiel a couple of times, um, but Early Intervention Week is celebrated every year. It's typically during the third week in May, and it was created to recognize all of the amazing caregivers of children in early Nicole, you're muted. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Sorry, what was the last thing that you heard me say? The early intervention. Okay, um, it's celebrated every year, you heard that? Okay, um, it was created to recognize all the amazing caregivers of children in early intervention, um, as well as the dedicated professionals that are in the field. Um, we know that all of you guys work so hard, the professionals, the parents, um, so we really wanted to recognize and celebrate you guys, um, and we give a week out of the year, it should be every day, but we have a week out of the year for us. Um, our theme this year is early relational health and creating connections in everyday moments. Early relational health are buzzwords that you may have been, um, they may have heard lately. And it is defined as a state of emotional well being that grows from the positive emotional connection between babies and toddlers and their caregivers when they experience strong, positive, and nurturing relationships with each other. It's really critical um, to creating healthy children, families, and communities. And that is what we're encouraging and supporting with all of our families. So, with that being said, we thought tonight's topic of learning how to understand and manage our children's behavior was really important because all parents and people that work with children have encountered challenging behaviors at some point. There's no way around it. Um, and at times we have no idea what to do or how to effectively help them. Um, so our speaker tonight will be teaching us that. So I'm excited to introduce Maria Emerson and she can give her background information and um, we're really excited to have you here, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love I love to see pictures of children on the um, on the Zoom and uh, the actual real children. I see real children too, so that's awesome. Um, and I do want to say I I understand that this can be a very challenging time um, for. Uh, families and with who have young children and um, understand if, if uh, you need to pop off, pop back on, it makes total sense to me. Um, and if you have any questions, I think um, just if you can type them in the chat and um, Nicole and Karen are kind of gonna monitor the chat and um, may hold the question or may um, bring it up. So, and then we'll save time at the end. Um, just to have some more Q&A. So I am going to share my screen. Um, and I, it's interesting because I'm used to redo Teams more. So I think I have it. Can you all see that? I see Karen. Um, yes, see we can face. see. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna put it a little. Okay, that's the, the large, you can see that okay all yeah, right that's perfect okay great um so i have a timer for myself because um well i'll go to the next slide and let you know i'm a speech language pathologist <laughs> and i um really like to talk so <laughs> um um so i try to keep myself on task by using um a timer which we will talk about um timers are awesome um but yeah that keeps me kind of on task um organized and let me know when I need to kind of move it along and or pause and things like that. 
So um, I am the director over rehab services and pediatric community-based services at Virtua Health. That is for those of you who live north of Hamilton, Mercer County. Um, it is a large health system in South Jersey. Um, and uh, we primarily serve Burlington, Camden, Gloucester counties. Um, the, this is my contact information. I will be sharing the slides with Nicole and her team so um, they can sh share them with you as well. Um, I've been in the field for, I can't even believe it. I can't believe that number, 31 years. I kept checking to make sure my, my calculating was correct and it is. Um, so I've been a speech language pathologist working in pediatrics, birth to 21 year olds for 31 years. And I've worked uh, all over. Um, I've worked in um, outpatient, I've worked in schools, I've worked in the NICU, I've worked in um, uh, outpatient settings. Um, but bir the, this birth to three early intervention is my heart. Um, and I, so I, I can't say enough about these years. They're so crucial and important. Um, I oversee um, several programs at Virtua, including our early intervention program, which is fairly, it's considered a large program. Um, we have school therapy services. We do uh, have a pediatric mobile services, so a van um, providing free um, services and screenings to children. We have something called Good Foods to Grow. We have an Aqua Buddies program, which is really cool. Um, swim lessons for children with special needs. And then I have what they call a dotted line to our outpatient pediatric services for rehab services, um, the NICU and the special care nursery. Um, my passion is for health equity for all children and their families, and they have an equal start. Um, so just again, an overview of some of the services we have at Virtua, um, I, I kind of um, highlighted those. And then what we, we treat every child, family member and caregiver as unique partners. Um, we wanna support your hopes and dreams for your child. We suspend all judgment and we wanna strengthen trust and relationships with the family and community members. And we're here to educate as well, which is, what we're doing today, hopefully you'll learn some stuff. Um, so our objectives are understanding the critical time of brain development. And that will really talk a lot about the early relational health that um, Nicole talked about. We'll define what is behavior, what does that mean? Um, and we'll understand why certain challenging or negative behaviors may occur. And then how can we integrate strategies in, into your just daily routine to, to manage these behaviors? Uh, critical years. Now, the first five years are the most critical um, period of development. Um, and they actually talk about, there's a lot of research if you, if you wanted to Google this on the first 1000 days. And that talks about um, actually when the, the child is conceived, so baby in utero. So it's really honing in on maternal health and, and, that, um, and the health of the baby there. So things start um, growing and developing even when baby is in utero in terms of um, later how uh, their development may be, have been affected by what happened those first 1000 days. So again, why, it's so important to have these strong um, nurturing relationships with our children and how it is very difficult to have that, especially if you have a lot of challenging behaviors that you're dealing with. Um, so just a lot of, of research has been done. Um, a lot now is really pouring out from this research on how important maternal child health is um, and uh, how that later can really show a trajectory positively or negatively impact um, your child in the future. So what we're here today, and that's why you're here, is how do, how do we make our um, experiences with our children early on really um, positive? Um, so as you know, um, any of you have been in early intervention for, I mean, really, 
once you get through the evaluation, you realize that we, are, we look at your child as the whole child. We're not um, taking pieces and parts of your child. We look at all areas of development and how they weave and interact um, with, with your, your child. So we look at adaptive or self-help skills. And um, this is probably a review for most of you, but that's like dressing and feeding, sleeping, um, cognition or how your child learns and plays. We, we, ha we have to take that into um, uh, account when we're, when we're uh, evaluating your child and their behaviors. Communication is key. And, you know, I'm biased because I'm a speech language pathologist, but um, communication really, I'm going to spend a lot of time on why communication um, can affect behavior. Um, gross motor, those are your large body movements. So walking, um, well, you know, it starts with sort of early on um, uh, um, rolling, um, sitting, pulling to stand, walking, that type of thing. Fine motors, your smaller um, mo motor movements, um, how you use your hands, even how you use your eyes to move um, and to look and search for things, hand-eye coordination, um, um, and it, uh, they call it figure ground. So how you can find things um, am amongst, you know, a, a bunch of other things. Sensory um, is uh, integration has to do with how you're, you integrate um, all these senses that are coming in from your environment. And then social emotional is uh, key. It's how your child um, sh can show resilience, how they can kind of snap back after something maybe negative happened, um, how they show their emotions positively or um, otherwise. Okay, so getting into behavior. Um, and behavior is not a bad word. <laughs> um, behavior is a fine word. We all have behaviors. Um, um, a behavior is just an action. It's, it's what, what you do in response to something. Um, so, so a lot of times, um, I do a lot of teams meetings and I'm, I'm pretty hyper person. So I don't like to sit. So I tend to like, I have, I got myself a swivel chair and I swivel. And sometimes I realize I'm really getting too swivelly because I can see myself and I need to calm myself in a different way and, or keep myself alerted really in a different way. So I, um, I'm just at using a behavior and I'm adapting to things um, so that I, I can stay focused or keep attend attendance. Um, so to know how to change a behavior, we must understand what the behavior is. So behavior is just, like I said, a response to something, someone, or uh, uh, entity in the environment. And um, it's just the way we function or operate. That's all a behavior is. So um, why do we have, um, uh, what, what could be the reason for the behavior or really a, like sort of a challenging behavior? Um, and we know communication is key. Um, when children are young, they primarily are communicating through their actions um, they're not, maybe don't have words. A lot of our children um, maybe are, are delayed in their communication skills in, in, in their speaking, I should say. Um, they may not have the ability to verbally tell us what even they're feeling. They don't even really know what that is. Feelings can be really um, scary. Um, and even how people react to the action of the child can um, be different amongst adults. And so children don't even really know what, what is the positive response to an action. Um, and, and they really have difficulty navigating and understanding those feelings. And, and just think about yourself sometimes, how you're like so overwhelmed with feelings. You really don't even know how to act. Sometimes we just kind of sit there kind of numb or giggle out of nowhere or run, want to run away from things. So it's very um, feelings and emotions really stir up a lot. And, and if you have difficulty communicating that or even understanding those feelings, um, you could, you could find some challenging behaviors. Um, and again, the, the 
children are responding to everything in the environment. So um, if they get a reaction because of something they did, they giggled and laughed. And then a, a, the, a family member came over and and you know, hug them and giggled and laughed with them. That's positive, that makes them feel good. So they may start using a giggle and laugh for lots of different attention seeking things. Um, and that seems like a good way to communicate. Some children might throw a toy at you because they know that if I throw a toy, my mom is gonna pick up that toy and come over to me and, and, and say something to me. So I'm, I'm getting the attention. So what we really need to do as parents and caregivers is to figure out why is this behavior occurring? What, whatever the behavior is, why is it occurring? And then how do we shape that to what we want if it's a challenging behavior? Um, let me just, this is not, this happens sometimes. Sorry, it doesn't, there we go. Okay, so determining the why. Um, oftentimes, I mean, and I wonder how many of you have ever said this, my child, you know, pushed his sister for no reason. My child threw the, their food across the table for no reason. The, the fact of the matter is there is always a reason, always. So that's the one thing we have to do. So let's figure that out. What could the reasons be? So here's some of the whys. And I'll go through each one of these um, and I'm be mindful of time so that um, we can do like real life um, things as well. So we, we need to really listen, listen to what we see. Um, and it, it almost doesn't make sense, but you have to listen to the actions. And that's how we can often determine the cause of behavior. The, the one thing too to note is that you can have the same behavior throwing um, you know, your cup across the table. You can have that same behavior for different reasons. So you have to look at the action, but you also have to look at what happened before. What happened, what did you do? And then what was the response of the child after? So that's the kind, that's what you have to look at. Sorry, I have, my allergies are really acting up today. Um, so when we determine the why the a behavior is, is occurring, that will help us determine how we can change or evolve that behavior. So what are some of the reasons? Social, um, attention or attention seeking, um, wanting to access a tangible, that's just something that, that they want, it's an object, or an activity. Um, they want to escape, they want to get out of there, or they're avoiding doing something. They're sensory seeking, they, they want something, or they're avoiding the sensory piece. They're having difficulty communicating, or there's other triggers. And there's three types of triggers, external, internal, and synthetic. So I'll go through all of these really um, right now. Um, attention seeking, I, and I'm very visual, so you just have to look at the picture. <laughs> so you know what attention seeking is. Uh, attention seeking really is um, using any type of behavior to gain attention. And the attention is usually of a caregiver. Um, or, or a, a peer, something like that. You want, you want someone to give you attention. So we do this by um, looking at someone across the room and then you're waving, you're trying to gain their attention. I did, my daughter just graduated college on Sunday and um, she's, it's huge auditorium. There's hundreds of people graduating. And I told Kate, I'm like, I'm the one standing up waving my arm. She's like, everybody's standing up waving their arm. Um, but that I was trying to get her attention, attention seeking. Um, we can, you know, hey, we can yell, we, um, we call, we can throw something or we can tap. Um, there's lots of ways to uh, um, obtain um, attention, but there's also negative um, ways. And, and so how do we do that? We do that by kicking hitting, throwing, biting. 
screaming, crying, that's another way of attention. So we, what we wanna do is take these negative, if it's an attention seeking behavior and it's one that we wanna change, we have to figure out the why and then help them through that. Tangibles, um, these are things that, that um, they're mainly um, things that um, provide a positive feeling typically for the child. Um, it could be a toy, it could be a food or a drink they want. They may want um, tickles, they may want to, you know, go out for a car ride, things like things that have meaning for them. So they're, they're wanting a tangible, they want um, a certain TV show on, that kind of thing. So the challenging behaviors often result when the child doesn't get what they want. Um, so they want the iPad. Um, and you're not going to let them have the iPad until they eat their dinner, whatever, whatever it is. They want to go outside and, or they want to stay outside. That's, that's usually one that we have. They don't want to go inside. They want to stay outside. They're going to have, they could potentially have a tantrum. So the desire for your child to have this object or this thing, this action can result in a negative behavior if they can't get it or it's gonna be taken away from them. So that's, that's what a tangible is. Um, escape and avoidance are two different things. Um, and these pictures um, are uh, not in the right order. <laughs> the one on top is actually avoidance. Um, that's usually you see when um, kids, you know, uh, turn their head away, they might push something away, they might fall to the floor, uh, um, they might throw the thing out of the way, excuse me. Uh -oh. And they're doing, doing that for a reason. Yes. They don't like it, it doesn't make them feel good, they've had a bad experience with it, they don't feel like doing that right now, they wanna do something else. There's always a reason for their behavior. Escape is literally escaping or running away or trying to get away from something. So we see this a lot when children crawl under the table because they don't want to eat. Um, they don't want to go to bed or they don't want to get out of bed. So they crawl under the bed, that kind of thing. Sorry, I'm going to just take a cough drop. Sorry. So they're two different things, escape and avoidance, but it's, it's because they don't want to do something typically, or they don't want something. Sensory integration is a really powerful um, um, piece that, that and our occupational therapists are the pros on, and that's a conversation in and of itself but I'll do my best to explain how this can affect behavior. And then if there are any further questions or you, know, you need more information, we can always reach out to our other um, professional um, colleagues. But sensory integration in a nutshell is how we process information that comes from the environment and what our bodies um, do with that information. And children can often get really overwhelmed because they don't know how to respond appropriately. Um, it might be too much for them or it might be not do enough for them. So you have to really pay attention. I've seen children with, um, with really increased auditory sensory um, systems that, that something can trigger them not in a way that might be like sort of an aggressive behavior, but they, I lost their attention because something, something, it could have been a bird in the distance that I don't even hear got their attention. So it's really important to see what, what's going on in the environment before you can kind of hash out what, what really is the cause of the behavior that you see? So we've got seven areas of sensory integration. Auditory is how you hear, what you hear or not hear. And it's how you process what you hear. 
Um, visual is what you see and how you process what you see. Um, olfactory is smelling, smells. Um, gustatory is tasting. Tactile, touching. Vestibular is your balance. Um, and, and how you, um, and, and uh, it, vestibular is, is how you write yourself in the environment, how you know if you're standing up, how you know if you're upside down, that kind of thing. Proprioception is movement, but it also has to do with um, how it feels when you move with your joints. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I can go um, talk a little. I'm, I'm, forgive me, let me just, um, okay, because we can go in a little bit more. So communication, this is the piece I'm going to really talk a lot. Let me just check my time. Okay. Um, so what is communication? It's, you might see, it's how we talk. It's how we talk to people. It's how we get messages across from, from one person to another, but it's really involved. Communication um, happens at multiple levels and it's, um, as simple as an action or, you know, nonverbal, um, a look, um, a gesture, um, and then, you know, moves on. It could be sign. If any of you attended last night, communication can be done through signs. Um, so it can be physically, you can see something and it can be verbally. So here's, um, the definition from the American Speech and Hearing Association, um, and it involves both understanding and expression. So how we, how we understand what communication is and how we actually express it or use it. And it includes movements, gestures, objects, vocalizations, verbalizations, signs, pictures, symbols, printed words, and output from any type of um, alternative or augmentative device. Um, I'm sorry, let me just go ahead here. Um, so let me talk a little bit about this stuff. So um, movement, I'm just gonna, Nicole, I'm gonna pick on you because I see your face. <laughs> um, what do you think I'm saying? Hi. Right. What do you think I'm doing? What do you think I'm saying now? Don't do that. Great. So that, that's all nonverbal. Um, I used movements. I used gestures. I could use sign. Um, we, if you're at a, a, a restaurant and you have to go to the bathroom, you have to use the bathroom. Um, Karen, I'll pick on you because I see you. How do you know where to go? You look for signs of the restroom. Okay, so what, what kind of sign? Uh, probably the restroom that says restroom or okay. the girl or boy. So you would, and you would say, oh, I need to go in the one that has the dress on it. Right. Right, exactly. So that, that's symbols. So you look for words, said restroom, and then you went and you saw the one that had the, the, the circle with the square. So you knew, okay, that's women's room. I have to go into that one. That's all communication. So not only um, is that, a, that's a expressive way, but you, Karen, you understood, and Nicole, you understood, you receptively understood what I was saying. You knew what a head shake no was and a, a wave of the finger. You knew what that meant. Um, our, our kids don't know that, especially if it's not consistent, if you're not consistently using certain things. So it's really very important. Consistency is really important when we're, when we're talking about communication and just how we react to behaviors. So receptive information, communication is the input, how we understand communication. So it's how we understand words, no, or, um, or the sign. Um, and expresses the output. How do we express? Um, uh, do we use actions, ver uh, actions, gestures, facial expressions, or are we using words, pictures, things like that? So we've got verbal, nonverbal, written, and visual. 
I'm sorry. I'm, I, I have another, another presentation. I wasn't sure if I got into that with the next slide. So let me talk about these four here. So verbal is spoken. You hear it. It's, it's typically words. Um, it could also be like, oh, oh, oh. So it could also be like how you emphasize a word um, and then it's paired with a facial expression. Nonverbal is usually no sound, sound off. So that kind of thing. Um, written is typically uh, words, words are written. And then visual could be picture symbols, things like that. Um, so children who are young or have difficulty using language may or will likely struggle with the following. They won't be able to ask or even understand questions. It, 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 they, it, it, that is a very high, it's a higher level um, concept. Naming or understanding the name of objects they may not know. Um, and it could be processing. There's, there's lots of reasons why, and, and your um, practitioners in the home are going to help you figure that out. And, um, you know, all your medical team. Um, why aren't they understanding when I call their name? Why aren't they understanding that this is a cup? Um, so that's, but a lot of times they will understand their cup if they see their cup, even a photo of their cup, they'll understand what that is but they may not understand the word cup. Um, they may not understand the use of gestures or you be able to use gestures. They may, there may be motor planning issues. So they want to, they're trying to um, communicate using uh, an action and it's just not, you're not even understanding what it is they're trying to say. Um, I find a lot of times parents, um, they'll say that their children know what they're saying and they know how to follow a direction. And then when we really hone in on it, but they're inconsistent say, but I know they know how to do it. Um, what I often find is that parents are um, using external other cues. They're saying, go get your shoes and they're pointing to the shoe and not even realizing that they've learned to do that. Did you want something to drink? You know, and they're kind of doing that just, just innately they're doing that which is actually what we want, what we, we, that would be a technique to use. A lot of children also have a difficulty understanding facial expressions, especially because people use a variety of facial expressions in different ways, um, or especially if children aren't great at giving eye contact, they're not even looking at you to see what your facial expression is. So if you're shaking your head going, mm, 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 nope, that's not good. They, they may not, it might be just a, a sounds to them and they're not even looking at you. Vocabulary, um, young children really, um, some have a great receptive vocabulary, others don't. And the use of a vocab, of the vocabulary. Um, I had a child once, mom, and this was in front of me. And um, she said, she's walking me to the door. And she said, he wanted to go out. He was pointing to the door. And she said, oh, I know you want to go outside. We'll go outside after we eat. He just heard, we'll go outside. That's all he heard. Um, I started to walk out the door. He started to go. Mom started yelling at him. He had a tantrum. He really thought, she, you just told me we were going outside. Um, and mom was like, after we eat, we'll go outside, but he didn't hear that. Um, and so, and then following directions, breaking, breaking directions down are really, it's really important to break down directions, um, especially if there's a lot of activity going along, a lot of external noise, things like that. And um, some um, triggers, um, that's a, such a common word these days, triggers. So there's external, internal, and synthetic, and I'll briefly go over that. External is anything in the environment that can be paired to a behavior. It could be a person um, they haven't seen grandma and they love grandma so much. And so what do they do? They run to grandma and give her a hug. Um, it, uh, that's, that's a behavior we like to see. Um, uh, another could be a 
a dog, let's say, and, and they got scared of a dog and now all dogs scare them. So they run away. Textures, um, they love their blankie and, and, and anything they can that's so comfy and they just want their blankie all the time. They love that. But there could be other textures they don't like, the tags in their shirts or um, some rough, the roughness of the, the car seat belt. Smells are, smells are the tricky one because they are a trigger. Um, and then you see some kids that are, you know, they take their blankie when it's fresh out of the, the laundry and they're smelling it and all, they love the whole thing about it. And, and then sometimes you could, especially mealtime, um, textures are huge. Smells are huge at mealtime. Like certain things are just triggers like, no, that doesn't make me feel good. I know that that doesn't make me feel good. And then sounds too. And I kind of was saying that before when I, uh, the little guy that I used to see, he heard things, the bird, the lawnmower, the phone in the house would ring. He would, he would, so we'd be doing well. And then all of a sudden I'd lose him. And after a while I realized he, he heard the phone ring. I'm going to address, I hear the phone too. Yeah, the phone's ringing and then we can go back. Um, so that's really important to kind of just get an, an idea of what's going on in the environment, external. Internal, this is hard because uh, we can't see this. Um, we don't know how they're feeling. You can get an idea maybe, you know, you're dropping them off at daycare. They're clingy. They're, they're standing at the door. They're crying. They're banging at the door. They're obviously anxious. They're not feeling safe. Um, they don't want you to go. They, they don't want you to go. They're, they're, that is an internal thing that you can sort of figure out what. Hunger, I've said, oh, this is how he gets when he's hungry. I realize this now. Or uh, illness is funny. Um, and you probably maybe have had this happen where you're like, this Johnny was so good today. <laughs> he was so calm. And then he, you know, that night breaks out with 104 fever. <laughs> and you're like, that's why he was getting sick. Um, so our, our, the way we react to things can, and have an internal thing too. Um, if you feel hot, if you're, if you're feeling itchy, um, a lot of kids who have GI issues or um, a teething pain, if they have fluid in their ears, there's all these little things that are going to affect the way they behave. And then synthetic. Um, this is something that's been constructed that will trigger a behavior. So um, I'll, 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 I, I had a family who um, used to, as soon as the practitioner arrived in the home, turn off the TV. <laughs> And then it was crying mayhem. And that is a change in your environment and also took away a tangible. So it's like, I'm, I'm here watching TV and now oh, Maria's coming in and I'm going to turn off the TV and my whole, my whole world is rocked right now. There wasn't any transition. There was nothing. And that, so now you're pairing this like knock on the door and here comes Maria and ah, I'm gonna cry because I'm not gonna get what I want. Um, so that's a good example of synthetic trigger. So you can think of other things that you might do um, or might might be something in the, um, the background. Um, uh, even um, if you uh, add like a, a, a treat, your dessert, but you have to finish the meat, your meal first, but they're like looking at the dessert. Like, I want the dessert. You have it on the table. Why can't I have the dessert? Um, that kind of thing can really be a trigger. Okay. So what are some things you can do now? And I was hoping I, I wove some of those in for you. Let me check the time. Okay. So, uh, visual schedules are really great. Um, and you can use pictures. There's online. There's so many things now, but it could be, um, and very, um, they're very concrete. It's very tangible. And, and I find the littler, littler kids do better with photo photographs. Um, although some children, if you have some visual issues, do better with the line drawings. Um, if, uh, 
I mean, back in the day, and still you get them every once in a while, your circular, you know, for your, your coupon or your groceries that are on sale or, you know, um, targets having, they'll, some, you get that catalog. I always have taken those and I'll just clip things out, um, use those or the, the cereal box, their favorite cereal, you know, clip out a, the symbol of that cereal, things like that you can use easily. Um, you can laminate or uh, people use contact paper. They just put them in photo books, things like that. Um, a lot of people use their iPads, their phones now. They'll make different albums um, on their phone. And um, you, can, you can make your own photo um, album of activities that you do and, and have the child, because they're so good with the phones now, you know, swipe to they want to go to the park or they, they point to the picture of the car, things like that. That's really um, something that you can use to help kids communicate their wants. You can also use it to say, first, we're going to eat. So we're going to have dinner. And then outside, so you can do things like that. Um, you can use it for if they, you know, stacked five blocks, then they get to, I don't know, whatever, jump on a ball. No, you shouldn't jump on a ball, bounce on a ball, throw a ball. Timers I talked about, I use timers all the time in my own life. Um, it really helps me transition and know when I need to transition. Uh, it, um, and there's no reason why we wouldn't and shouldn't use these with our kids. And there, uh, with technology these days, there's really cute timers out there, but you've got a timer on your phone. And any of you, I'm sure, have used your own timer and kids know when the alarm goes off, something's happening. Um, I do this a lot with the children I see um, because we, you know, and my timer's going off right now. Um, um, when when it's, we're ready to sort of transition out of the activity so I can start writing my session note, that, become, that can be traumatic for the child. All of a sudden it's an external trigger potentially. Oh my gosh, here goes Maria. But it can also be made into a, a good transition, if, uh, something fun. Um, and then, um, so concept of time is really hard. So you wanna start, if, you, if it's sitting at the table, I want them to sit at the table with the family for dinner. Well, dinner time can be long, but if it's 30 seconds, if it starts out for 30 seconds and they sat for 30 seconds, that is fine. And then you just keep increasing that time. Kids, children, they wanna move. They wanna be around. They don't wanna necessarily be hanging out at the table for 20 minutes. Um, so these are just some activities. Um, you could do silly fun stuff like when they hear the buzzer go off, they get to throw a ball into a basket, um, throw the ball into the basket and run into the house. And you just change the transition. Um, it's independent play too. Um, some, probably one of the most frequent outcomes I hear, and we make it into an outcome is, it, families, you say, what, what, do you, what would you like? You know, I would like to be able to go to the bathroom by myself. <laughs> I do not want company with me or someone banging on the door. And it's, it's a, it's a one minute um, activity for the mom. I just want a minute to go to the bathroom by myself. Timers are a really good, good way to, to increase that length of time that they're going to stay by themselves or spend on a, on, on a single activity. Um, with communication, it's really, like I said, understanding the way your child is communicating, figuring out what it is they're trying to say to you, and then giving them the word, the action, the picture symbol, that type of thing. Slowing down, using gestures when you're, um, when you're giving a command. Um, I need you to stand up, and you can even stand up, and let's walk and get our coat. Uh, I see this a lot in childcare centers and the, the, these kids are always like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening. You could see the anxiety, you could see them getting upset and then they end up usually oftentimes having a tantrum because they don't know, well, we were just playing here at the table with Play-Doh and now what am I, what's happening? Why is everybody moving? They don't understand. 
of course they're going to have a, some type of a challenging behavior. Um, so setting the clear expectations using simple speech. Um, first, eat. Second, iPad. They may not understand what that is right away. They won't. But if you always use the same thing, first, eat, and then you're going to eat, second, iPad, or I'm making this up, um, they're going to they're gonna understand. It's your consistency with things. Um, you have to have the child's attention. And you have to be able to help the child do what you want them to do. So if they're over climbing up a bookshelf, <laughs> You need to be able to tell, tell them, no, get down. Um, but then you need to help them down. So you, you can't be across the room telling them to get down. They're not even looking at you. They're climbing a bookshelf right now. So you have to really make sure that you have their attention and that they understand, get down. Oh, you got down. That's dangerous. And you can use words like that. Dangerous, scary, not safe um being being very an active listener and active watcher to be patient keep calm shouting shouting just becomes a bunch of sounds um nothing nothing nothing's heard after with shouting and and then if you if you're a shouter or a yeller when you really need to get their attention it's still it's just that external noise that they always hear with the shouting i'm i i rarely raise my voice I rarely in life um but when I do I get attention because I rarely raise my voice um be empathetic watch your tone and and, and um body language um you don't want to startle your child you want to be supportive and then the seven c's are communication of communication are clarity correctness conciseness courtesy I don't even know why concreteness it's a tongue twister for me consideration and completeness so it's very important to state what you're saying be consistent with what you're saying ball get ball if that if that's how it as as clear and complete as you need to be um using reinforcers this is just a quick tip um because re reinforcers can reinforce negative behaviors. So you have to be careful. And I use the idea, I'm using an iPad just because that seems like what everyone has these days. Um, I'm not, I'm definitely um, decreased screen time, very important. I do feel that there's a place in life for iPads. Um, so if your child is tantruming and you, give them the iPad to calm them down. They're learning that if I want that iPad, I can have a tantrum. So that's using a tangible item, an iPad, to decrease a challenging behavior, um, having a, a tantrum, crying, but you're actually reinforcing the tantrum. So you have to be really careful about what, how you're using your reinforcers. So in a scenario where it's, you can have the iPad when you calm down, you know, so, if, you know, that type of thing. So um, be, be careful with your, with your um, reinforcers. I see that a lot. Children start learning. If I, if I throw my banana um, and, and, keep throwing my banana, then my mom will then give me pretzels. Um, so just, just watch carefully what you're doing there. Movement breaks are key, especially children who um, have difficulty sitting and attending. Um, and children who need um, a, a lot of that proprioception, that's like really feeling the movement. They, they're often your toe walkers, your, your bangers, your clappers. Um, your hitters, um, those kids, they're, they're kind of fun to work with in the sense like they like, you give them stuff to do. They, they're the ones that are going to help you put your groceries away or move the laundry basket down the hallway, things like that. So, so there's lots of ways your, your practitioners can help you 
um, um, put movement breaks into your daily routines. But it is really important. And, and even just calming music, you know, slow dancing, things like that is really um, great. Um, doing finger plays and, 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 um, and song, singing in songs is, is really, really, really great and often gets children back on track. I, um, keeping things organized in your house is really important. Having a place for things, categorizing things. And you can use, this is a great, this is a, a house, a family's house. They bought these shelves. You get them, I've seen them at Target and the little cubbies. And they put, um, they put photographs of what's in everything. It just, it helps for tangible things. The child can point to the picture when they want something. Um, they know where to put things away, things like that routine and structure. Um, I, I say COVID did a number on us all. Um, and it, it really um, changed all of us and all of our um, ways of, of how we have operated in our homes, especially when we were all in quarantine. It was really, you know, I don't have to tell you. So we got to get, we got to get the kids back to that routine and structure. What can they expect? Because, and I, I'm sure you feel the same. When you know what to expect, you feel better. You feel calmer. Sensory corners are fantastic. Um, a lot of people talk about timeouts. Um, I, uh, as a, and that becomes this negative thing. Uh, I, I think sensory corners are great. Why don't you go into your sensory corner? Take a break. It's okay. Um, it's a calming, soothing environment, depending on what they like. Some, some kids love the tactile stuff. Some like it just really nice and, and um, cozy and, and warm with lots of blankets and a dark tent, things like that. It's a great, uh, just a corner of your room, a corner in, behind a couch, behind a chair, put a blanket over the, the, um, the couch and just let them chill out. Maria, um, there's a question that chatted that might be a good place to ask. Sure. Um, her daughter, or their daughter comes home with a lot of anxiety and stress from school um, and has a lot of challenging behaviors. Um, so what can she do at home to help her with those behaviors? It, it is, it is, um, and I wonder how she does in school. She's probably just trying to keep it together the whole day. Um, so what, what that tells me is home and you are a very safe place to her. She, she feels like I can finally let go. I've kept it together this whole day and now I can just be, be me and I know I'll be loved. That's what that's telling me. So I know, and it's busy, it's busy when you get home, especially if you have other kids and you've got to get dinner and or snacks and off to sports or whatever it is um it's really i would use the time and if you're picking her up from i'm not sure the routine but i would start with the car ride um i would start with really calming music um singing together um if she's dropped off you know entering the door it's very pleasant having really just like, you know how you have a bad day at work and all you want to do maybe is, I don't know, go lay on the bed and <laughs> listen to your favorite music or whatever. Kind of think of it like that. If she needs a time to just chill out and relax and know that that's a safe thing for her to do. Um, but routine is key. So, you know, first then, first then. That I don't... I, I don't, I know that's quick and I don't know enough about it, but your practitioners should be able to help you out with that as well. I hope that helped. She said her behavior in school is really good. Um, but then at home she does tantrum, hit her brother and scream. Yeah. She knows it's a safe place. She's held it together. So, you know, you can go to the school and figure out what is it about that. And, it, and if she's not, a maybe she's not communicating well in school. So a lot of kids that have, um, they're 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 able to understand a lot of communication but they're not able to use communication i don't know the situation here but um they often are working so hard in school just to stay on track and know what's going on that when they get home they just let loose it's it's extremely common and it's just it's okay just got to give her the words and how can she 
um, use those behaviors in a more positive way. We have another question that kind of goes along with that. Yeah. Um, strategies for kids who harm themselves, like scratching, hitting, or banging their head when they're overwhelmed or don't want to do something. Yeah. I see that a lot. I feel like usually, and again, I don't know all the scenarios, and you really do have to do sort of a behavioral assessment. Like, and I don't mean <coughs> that I in like really see what the situation is going on. But um, when you, I usually delve into more, I get gain more information. A lot of times the scratching, I mean, they're self-harming because they get attention. So it could be, I come over to make you, you know, stop banging your head because I don't want you to get hurt. Or, you know, I'm, put, I'm rubbing your arm, you know, because you scratched yourself. So they're getting attention. But why are they doing that activity? You have to kind of find out, is it we just transitioned a lot. I feel like a lot of it's that all of a sudden they're watching, you know, their favorite show and you say, okay, time to eat. And you're, you're bringing them into the kitchen and they're like, I don't want to do this. So they're going to, and so that the action, the behavior is just a way of communicating and they happen to choose self-harm. So it could be kids who scratch, bite, bang their heads or smack their heads often if that's a proprioception, perceptive thing too. Um, so they're getting some feedback that way. That would be, I would definitely work with your um, practitioners in the home too. If they, you have to kind of figure out why that's happening. <laughs> Sorry. Did that help? I hope. Um, easy to say, <laughs> keep calm. But um, there was a thing here, the fundamental job of a toddler is to rule the universe. <laughs> I truly believe that's absolutely true. Um, and they're going to do it any way they can. So we really have to be um, supportive, try to figure out what's, what's the issue is. And then um, model good behavior, model what they should do, catch children being good. Especially if you have a very challenging, a child with a lot of challenging behaviors, whenever they're doing anything good, catch them in that moment. Oh my gosh, I love the way you're building blocks. Or you gave me such a sweet kiss. Thank you so much. That type of thing. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like lots of resources that we're going to give to you all, um, resources for, um, you know, checking your ch children's milestones, where you can get further services, um, <clears throat> and what to do if you're concerned, which you're, you're in early intervention, so you're doing a great job at that. Um, and then when little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not our chaos. Um, so that's that's the key. I'll try to remain as calm as you can. Calm, no shouting. You know, I, it's easy to say, but that that's sort of the key here. So I'm going to stop sharing. See, my timer didn't help me out. Now it's 7:01. Um, yeah, I know it's seven o'clock, um, and that was the time. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for joining. We do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, so. If, um, Marie, you wouldn't mind hanging on for a couple minutes and maybe we can address some of the questions yeah, or if you have a question, put it in the chat um, and we will be sending this recording along with the resources like I mentioned out next week. Um, so you guys can keep an eye open for that. But if you're going to head off, thank you so much for joining us and um, have a good night. Thank you all. So the first question that I see is... Um, I often sing to change the mood when my toddler starts a tantrum. It usually works. Is this good or should I let her have her moment? So singing usually, oh, if I understand the question, so the child might be having a, some type of a tantrum, singing then gets them sort of out of the, is that what, is that what, what it sounds like? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no, I mean, children can have their moment. Let them have their moment. But if you found something that sort of brings 
your child out of the moment, there is no reason why you shouldn't use that. Um, the, you want to, though, also figure out, so you use distraction, which is great. I mean, and you used a positive uh, a distraction. So, uh, you know, you, it's not about, it's not necessarily about having a moment. It's definitely about figuring out why they are having the moment, but that you're bringing them out that way. That's a really positive nurturing way to bring them out. So I keep, use it. You can change up the song though. Um, you could say, I'm, you know, I'm making something up. I know you're upset. I know you're upset. Mommy wants to give you a hug. I made that song up right now, but there's no reason. I can see you're sad. I see your tears or whatever it is. You can label what they're doing with a melody, a sing song melody. And then I want to give you a hug and make it better. You know, something like that. But yeah, for sure. So a lot of kids have very favorite songs. As soon as you put on whatever the song is, um, could be a theme song for something. They're totally like, oh, this is what I like. And you've distracted them from whatever it is. But just remember, you want to kind of figure out why, what what was the, the, the reason for the moment? Next question is probably something that everyone deals with all of the time. Um, <laughs> but their child constantly um, tells her and her teachers no when asked to do something. And he's also trigger triggered and throws a tantrum when he is told no. So no is a big trigger. No is that no. No is a great word to yes. do that. Yeah. So what are strategies to help change no being such a triggering word? Yeah, it, I, it would be interesting to know if your child even understands what that word actually means. Um, yes and no can be a really higher level um, concept. Yes and no. Um, and a lot, I don't know if this has ever happened, but they'll say, do you want a cookie? And they say, no. And then they reach for the cookie and take it. You know? um, so it would be sort of interesting to know if they understand what the word no is. But um, that's very common. And um, so uh, the thing I often do is I don't ask yes to no questions. I make comments. I have a cookie. I mean, you might not want to, <laughs> they probably, they might not say no to a cookie, but um, instead of saying, do you want to go outside? Um, say it's time to go outside. So change the question to a comment. That's what I would do to alleviate the answer of no, because if you don't ask a yes, no question, they can't say yes, no, um, if that makes sense. Um, when you say no, of course, when you say no to kids, especially if it's something tangible or uh, an activity or an object or a food or something that they want and you say no, they're gonna have a tantrum. So. I would not say no. I would say something else. Like if so, if you know that they're reaching for the cookie and you don't want them to, or I'm trying to think of that. It might be something more danger. If it's a danger kind of thing, reaching for the stove, no hot, um, that kind of thing. But if it's um, mommy outside and you can't go outside, instead of saying no, you're going to say dinner time, you know, something like that. So I, I, not giving them the opportunity to say no and, and not using no, it'd be the, the best thing um, I suggest doing. Okay, and Nina says that she distracts her child often when she's having a tantrum, but it's not actually teaching her how to manage her emotions differently. So what could she do? Um, kind of without seeing, because distraction is okay. Uh, if it's a good reason to distract. So if, if distract, whatever you're using to distract um, your child is stopping the behavior or the, the negative behavior, the emotion, the, the crying or the, uh, the tantruming, that is sort of allowing them to change their emotion. But you have to put words to it. Um, you, um, you know, and, and you can use big long words and sentences and then break it down. So it, especially if you know what it is, um, um, I don't know, They a lot of times it's they don't wanna come, and come inside or they don't like what they're eating or, you know, there, a lot of the reasons why children have negative or challenging behaviors is 
because of that, those reasons. So you have to figure out what the reason is, what the reason why is, and then work there. But to distract them out of it is, is fine. It's fine to distract because you're moving them on then. And then you can talk to them about it, potentially. I don't know, you know, the level of how little your child is and that, that type of thing. Um, but you have to know what the behavior, why the behavior is happening in order to help them manage it. I, I hope that helps. Distracting is okay. Okay, here we go. Um, my daughter gets very upset in T-ball when she doesn't get the ball. Then she throws her mitt, starts screaming, runs to the outfield, throws herself on the ground and cries. I left her there and let the coach address it or until safe to get her. I didn't want to positively reinforce the negative behavior by, by running onto the field. However, any, I'm sorry, something's in the way. How, sorry, I just lost it. Oh, however, um, is there a better way to respond? I recently taught her to punch into her glove, which helped a bit, but she still cries and screams. Um, and this helped her to stop throwing the glove. My daughter normally gets angry, which quickly turns to sad and her being very apologetic. Says sorry often, even when not in trouble. Oh, she's so, so sweet. Oh. <laughs> um, so T-ball, I'm just curious. Um, I feel like I would need to know more information, but it, it's hard in a situation like that. So I almost want to do something more at home in a staged kind of thing um, to get to, to kind of help, like almost like a script, like this is what, you know, what you're feeling and, and, and how you should, you know, what how how she's feeling you're so mad you didn't get the ball oh that's that's frustrating i'm gonna get the next one you know that kind of thing so it's very hard when you're in in a situation like that so i would definitely um make it in a smaller um arena at home or with you know um if you if you have a therapist um in the home um i'm trying to think of what else you said so as long as she's safe, I think it, in that scenario you gave to leave her like that, it was okay. She's, she's gets mad. Then she's, then she feels bad about getting mad. And, I, and that's actually nice re, um, use of her emotions. So I would just, I would just label that. I know you, you got so upset and you got angry and then you hit your friend and then you felt sad about that. And that's okay. You know, we, we, you know, I understand that. And just, I would, I would um, continue to sort of label that. I don't know if she's maybe a delayed talker, so she doesn't have the words. That often is what I see when children, or they're so overstimulated, they can't even find the words. So kind of trying to figure out um, that you, I don't know when T-ball is, if you're in early intervention still, but you could always have your therapist come out or take a video. Um, and they often can help you navigate that as well. It's yeah. hard to Someone, answer specific, you know, if you don't have all the pieces. Someone suggested a social story for T-ball or yep. um, even like a book about T-ball beginning. Yep. Um but it sounds like she also taught some replacement behaviors, which was awesome. And that's yes. some of the behaviors too. Right. Can you just explain um, what the social story means? What do you, what does that mean to do with her? A social story? If someone, someone else recommended it, I don't know if they wanted to talk about it. I mean, I don't, a lot of times social stories are, and you can make them out of photos yourself. Um, where you, you actually teach a story about what happened. So it could be, you know, you're playing t-ball and it's, it's a sequential thing and what can happen. So, you know, I didn't get the ball and I don't know if it's when it's hit, she didn't get it. I'm not sure what the scenario is, but think about all the scenarios in t-ball that happen or whatever the situation is. And um, you can say, but that's okay. I'm going to get a chance to get the next ball. You know, and it's through using usually fo photos at this young age, I would say. As children get older, you can use words. A lot of people do, um, they might even do filming and, and do a story of the, the video that they did. 
oh, look at um, Sammy hit the ball. Um, Sarah ran to, to get it and she didn't get it. Sarah got mad, you know, that kind of thing. If, if whoever said that, please jump in. Um, I have a two and three year old who often mimic each other <laughs> negative behaviors. What advice do you have for that? Two and three? I don't know. No. <laughs> so they mimic each other. That's the best when siblings do that. Um, yeah. Again, it depends on what it is. Some things, and you, you got to take, you, you know, you're going to, am I going to let this go? Um, you know, two and three, that is tough. That's probably the toughest thing, um, especially if they have different levels of, of um, in different developmental levels. And I don't know if one of them's, you know, needing more support, whatever that is. Um, it's modeling the, the, the behavior you want, I would say. Talk about, you know, I, mean, I don't know what the scenario is, but, you know, talking about what you want to see happen and then reinforcing the good stuff, I would say, is, is that's, I, it's hard for me to say. Um, I'm sorry with that. So Keep we had no, I'm okay. Cynthia um, asked if um, we ever use the book Monday When It Rained. It's one of her favorites. Oh, I don't know. S Cynthia, is that Cynthia Newman? Mm -hmm. That is. <laughs> I don't know that book. Oh, uh, well, it's a book of a picture of a little boy and he's making an expression. And on each page, it says like, you know, I was sad on Monday because it rained. And then they have the look of sadness. So each page has a statement and then a look. And I found it very helpful over time to use with kids because it's so visual. Yeah, it actually, one of the things they do say is for help regulating emotions with kids, and that sounds like a great book, is not, not in this situation, but it could be during a fun time saying, what's it like when you're happy? You know, show me happy. And how, how do you look when you're sad? Or how do you look when you hurt yourself? That kind of thing. And, and you, I mean, they may not know that answer, but when you, you're going to do it with them, obviously. And then you start, then when you start labeling these emotions in real time, you look really happy. You caught the ball. You know, you look so mad you didn't get the ball. And then, then they, then you start pairing what these emotions are, these internal feelings are with words and and facial expressions. So yeah, that sounds like a great book. I enjoyed this so much. Awesome. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? All right, we have one more that just popped up. Yeah. Um, from day one, my daughter's response is frustration and tantrum to show communication. For example, juice is life. She cries every time she <laughs> wants juice or when she wants us to open the fridge. We do a countdown and breathing exercises to get her to calm down. Is that enough? How do we get her to know crying isn't the best way? I want to change the behavior, not just ameliorate. Did I say that right? Um, for the moment, she's two. I got, I, she's uh, not talking, I'm assuming. She is communicating beautifully, it sounds like. Just <laughs> not the way you would like her to communicate because she learned that um, I walk over to the fridge, I try to open it because uh, I want my juice. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried, I would, uh, personally, I would try using a picture or a symbol like a her cup or a sippy cup or whatever whatever you put her juice in um or if it's a special you know certain type of juice i would take a photograph of that juice and i would have it on the refrigerator potentially like on a ma in a magnet or something like that um that she can just go and point to when she wants it um and and the thing with that is teaching her to do that juice i mean you're gonna have to give her juice. I would give her small amounts of juice in her, you know, cup or what, however you're giving it to her. If you're kind of teaching her the use of that picture. Um, and then juice, I mean, that's a, a j is a hard sound. Um, 
to make it's one of our later developing sounds. But um, if you taught a sign, you know, choose something like that. I would definitely move away from the crying though. She's communicating beautifully, like I said. So she understands she's paired. If I do this, I'm gonna get this. Um, but I would, and then I would, I would hold off and once she, you know that she knows that that picture means juice or this, this, if you, she does this, it means juice. Once you know she knows that, I would not give her juice if she's crying, if that makes sense. And that could take a while. Patience. Excellent. All right, looks like we went through all the questions. Are there any more? I know we're kind of getting a little bit late. Um, maybe if anyone has any additional questions, they can just email us and we can get back to them that way. Sure. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>